Hamish, it must have been a relief to have got through a, a full year. You finally closed the book on the Vic, um, diesel plant and the Brisbane Airport link losses, and you produced a result at the top end of your guidance without new major blemishes. How do you feel about it? Uh, it's not a relief. Uh, if I look at, you know, what do I feel about it, I feel proud. You know, the, you know, we're a company, as I've told you before, that's made up of people, and, you know, there's 56,000 people out there who worked you know, incredibly hard over the last 12 months to make that possible. So, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, looking at the, at the results and, and feel, you know, really proud of the achievements of the staff. You responded to those losses on those two projects, and they were big losses, by making changes to the nature of the entities within the group and the relationship between the holding company and the operating companies. Can you explain what you've done and why? Yeah, the, probably the number one change we've made is really defining what the purpose of latent holdings is. And, Leighton Holdings is a strategic management company, so we sit there, we look at, you know, what are the benefits of being part of the Leighton Group? Uh, you know, what does our portfolio look like? Where should we allocate our balance sheet, our leadership development and succession? But we deliver through our operating company, so, you know, we've supported our operating companies, we've, we've shared best practice, we've harmonised systems, uh, but in the end it's about our operating companies delivering, our operating companies being, being empowered, and about Leighton Holding providing the strategic portfolio overview. Uh, Hamish, under Wall King, those operating companies competed with each other. Um, I, my impression is they no longer do that. They, they submit their tenders to the finance director and the, the sort of vigorous competition under Wall doesn't happen anymore. I think the, you've got to remember that the company is people, so what actually competed against each other you know, might have been people, and I can assure you that you know, that hunger and desire to be successful and achieve is still there within the group. The, the thing is that it's not as public as it, as it was. It's a very small percentage of our portfolio where our operating companies compete. And it's actually unique to Australia because the, you know, what people forget is a large part of our footprint is actually in Asia and the Middle East. And there we have, you know, we have a brand that uh, presents all of the services to the market. So what we're starting to do is to export those core competencies and centre of excellence across the whole of the Leighton Group and, and really working with the opcos of what really differentiates them in the marketplace. All of our opcos in Australia are really good at infrastructure and building in urban centres and in the capital cities. But, you know, we've got Leighton contractors have a strong footprint in iron ore in the west. You know, Tees will have a, a strong footprint, you know, in coal, you know, in the Bowen Basin. And, you know, so our operating companies you know, geographically and sectors have different niches. And, but I can assure you, you know, that, you know, that competition uh, desire to be successful is, uh, is still there across, you know, the whole group and all of our projects. I used to compete on price. I have a question about that. They, I, I, I accept that there was only in a small area is, or in terms of the whole group, but where they had competencies, where there was joint competencies, they competed on price. We don't see that now because the prices all go to the finance director. Yeah, I think, no, that, no, what actually happens is uh, projects under our work procurement standards that we identify as a high risk, which were projects, you know, when we looked at them, such as VDP and Airport Link, uh, they come into latent holdings through our risk management team led by Mike Rollo. And at the very early stage, we, we look at, at uh, evaluating the risks, we look at evaluating the companies that we have, and we work on assembling, uh, uh, you know, a team with the OPCO so that we present, you know, the best... Uh, a selection of companies forward to manage that risk. Uh, you look at Northwest Rail here, we've got a, a joint venture between John Holland and, and Tease, a, a joint venture also between John Holland and Leighton on another uh, package. So uh, what we're doing is before it actually gets to that price stage, uh, we're putting the best, uh, our best foot forward with the uh, best team, best people. And when I say team, it's not just our own opcos, it's also the consultants, the supply chain, uh, and, and everybody that, uh, that helps support the delivery of our projects. Hamish, you, you seem to be less fixated today about the, the quantity of the work in hand that you have than you might have been in the past, and more concerned about the quality of the work you tender for and the margins that are available. Is that, is that a fair comment? A very fair comment. Uh, we've made it uh, clear that we don't uh, plan to grow for the sake of growth's sake. You know, we're a, a very large company. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities uh, to grow by exporting our core competencies to markets where they're valued and where we can extract value. But, you know, there's no point us subsidising infrastructure. You know, we, we want to, you know, get a fair return for our services and, uh, and that really is the focus on the bottom line. 
but it's not just about the price that we deliver to our clients, it's about how can we be more productive, you know, how can we get benefit about being part of the latent group, you know, reducing the number of tenders we put in, increasing our win rate, uh, shared services, uh, you know, our buying gain. So it, that's what we're looking at is how can we differentiate ourselves and how can we add value, increase utilisation, increase our productivity. The two projects that got you into trouble were PPPs in a sense. Um, I think you've said that you're not really keen on taking patronage risk in future, so I assume that means you're not really keen on toll roads. Have you changed your perception of an approach to PPPs generally? I think the you know to say we're not keen on toll roads you know is is not a fair statement. You know we're you know we're an infrastructure builder, and if I look at the infrastructure deficit, uh, not just in toll roads, but you know whether it's urban infrastructure or economic infrastructure, we we want to participate and we plan to participate in the development of those projects. What we're talking about is ensuring that there is a fair you know risk and reward structure in that and. You know, in the end of the day, you know, we, we have to enter into contracts that we have the ability to get a return on and, uh, and, and we've also got to understand and manage the risks. I think that's what we're talking to people about is, you know, if we enter into an arrangement, where should risks um, lie? Who should be responsible for risks? Is that the main lesson or one of the main lessons you learned from the desalination plant? Well, the, the desalination plant wasn't about the, uh, the income stream. Uh, in the PPP, that was, uh, you know, we, we had two major issues there. One was a, a productivity, productivity issue and the other one was inclement weather. They were the two issues that caused us uh, large uh, time delays. You're, um, you're suing or the um, Aquashore and then that the goes on to the Victorian Government over the Industrial Relations Act changes and uh, cyclonic weather in Melbourne and in Victoria. Um, is, is any of the is that incorporated in your accounts in any way or is that just a contingent asset? Now that when we, we completed the job in, in December and you know, have handed it over you know, to Aquashore, uh, we're in discussions with Aquashore and, and the state on resolving you know, the last of the commercial issues. But you know, the, you know, really the future for us now is, uh, is not about Airport Link and, and VDP. You know, the, the team did an incredible job to complete both those projects last year against uh, a lot of sceptics and, and you know, we, we did a, a great job in the operation delivery sense. What we've got to do now is, uh, you know, is to close off you know, those projects. All those projects have a, you know, a tail on them but that tail is, uh, is not big and you know, the future that we're looking at now is, uh, is positioning ourselves to deliver you know, $43.5 billion of work in hand that we've got and securing additional opportunities to uh, you know, make sure that we've got a, you know, a promising and, and, and sustainable future. But that, but those, uh, it's about a billion dollars that we're talking about and... Um, uh, we, haven't, we haven't valued a uh, billion dollars worth of claims, I can assure you of that. Okay. I, I don't really, you know, it's not appropriate that we discuss our, you know, commercial position at the moment. We've got, we also have a joint venture partner uh, on VDP in the way of, you know, Degremont, part of the Suez group and, uh, you know, obviously working very closely with the... Uh, with our partners and, uh, and we'll pursue our entitlements. Is it fair to say that most of the desalination labour conditions and, uh, and methods of operating um, in terms of labour relations um, are basically spread around the country into bigger co contracts so that you, 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 the, 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 the major infrastructure projects that are undertaken around the country basically follow the desalination precedents? No, I, I don't think that's fair at all and I also don't think it's it's fair to, uh, you know, to you know, sort of point to, to just labour productivity. Productivity um, manifests itself you know, as a whole series of, uh, you know, of initiatives, whether it's you know, skill level, it's uh, location, rosters, uh, you know, sort of the nature of the, the trades, et cetera. And, and you know, we had a, a workforce that did an incredible job at, uh, at, at VDP and at uh, Airport Lincoln. Yeah, we, we've got, apart from those two projects, we've got another you know, 400 projects spread around the world and around the country and you know, every, every project has its different issues and it's not all about productivity and certainly the productivity challenges that we're seeing in Australia do not just uh, manifest itself in, in the labour rates, there's, uh, there's a lot more to it. The, the IR environment and building construction has, has been a major topic of discussion though recently, Hamish. Are you, you're saying it's not an issue for you? No, look, it is an issue, but you've got to look at what percentage of our direct costs and indirect costs actually are labour, and, it, and that varies uh, from project to project. It's a huge issue for Australia 
you know, I think just last week I was reading something about, you know, Sydney now is, uh, you know, is the most expensive uh, city in the world. And, and, you know, that should be a, a concern, you know, to the nation. And I, I think that's something that Australia has to address over time is its competitiveness, its relevance in the region, uh, its overall efficiency. And, you know, one of the key things that, you know, we're going to need to focus on is, is infrastructure to help uh, compensate that, to make ourselves more competitive. Uh, education, training, you know, population, diversity, you know, there's so many things that come into our productivity and our relevance uh, in the region and, and that's certainly something that I'm sure both, uh, you know, whichever government is, is in power will, uh, will work on. Hamish, the uh, Victorian government has put in guidelines and banned Lend-Lease. Um, uh, are you able to meet those guidelines in Victoria? Well, we're not banned, so, you know, that should uh, answer itself. No, 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 not sure that's true. I then not think no, that we've got, there's a, you have not signed, you signed an agreement before we, the, the, the we, cut-off date, whereas they, they signed it afterwards. Now, that's a timing issue. Um, your agreement will come um, up for renewal, and, and if you were to repeat the current agreement, you'd be banned. Yeah, look, I think the, you know, the issue that we have is we've got three operating companies that work in, in Victoria, and, and obviously we'll work very closely, you know, on a project-by-project project basis on our, in industrial agreements and, and we will you know we will comply and you know we will we'll work both with the unions and with government and regulations and you know to ensure that we you know we navigate through these issues. I think the you know the main challenge there is as far as the industrial relations climate is uh, you know is during this transition period and you know it is unfortunate for those who you know who test these things uh, first uh, you know uh, you know first out of the block so you know, it's not good what we're seeing happening down there, but, you know, if you look at our business and, and you look at Victoria, this is a, a bigger issue for Victoria because at the moment, you know, that we do not have a lot of work in the state now that VDP has finished and Victoria does have need of infrastructure. Uh, it, it has a lot of work that's, uh, that's required, so it's something that the state is going to have to, to work on. I'm sure they will. Do you think they will change the guidelines? I don't want to comment on that. That's not... Uh, not something I can speculate on, except, uh, you know, as I pointed out before, as a, as a nation, I'm sure it's incumbent upon all of us, you know, whether it's political or business, uh, to ensure that Australia remains relevant, productive, efficient, uh, and takes, you know, full advantage of, uh, of its position at the, you know, at the foundation of the Asian century. We're blessed with great resources, with, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible, you know, country, and I'm sure will be good custodians of that, uh, that opportunity in the future. Hamish, you mentioned earlier the North West uh, Rail Project in New South Wales. Um, as I understand it, um, uh, all the major tenderers have, uh, and the subcontractors, I think, as well, have, have uh, reached an agreement with the unions which set out the working conditions and the pay rates and the overtime rates and all the things that, that take place in that contract, uh, and they all have the same agreement. Um, uh, so therefore you tender on the basis of, of your margin and in your skills in tunnelling and things of that sort. Um, but the labour conditions are uniform for all. Would you agree that's, that's happened? No, look, I, I couldn't comment on that and I don't believe that is the case. Uh, you know, all I can talk about, I, I sat in the review obviously for, uh, for the job uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago and I've been through a series of reviews. Uh, all I can comment on and, and talk about is what our strategy is and and what we've done and uh, you know we've you know we have uh, two operating companies that have come together there with also a third uh, partner so we've got three you know companies that have joined together as a joint venture for the first package that's gone in uh, and we've made our our view on on labour and, and productivity. Have you reached an agreement with the unions on this? No, we haven't because we haven't been awarded the uh, the project. Hamish, to get back to that issue of cost es escalation, how it might apply to, to Leighton, you've got a very large exposure to the resource sector. All the big miners are now trying, saying they're going to claw back the cost escalation they've experienced over the last few years. And they've all said this will have implications for their contractors. Have you been affected then? Or, and do you think you might be? Uh, we have been affected, uh, both in a positive sense and a negative sense. I think, you know, part of reducing cost, it doesn't mean self-performing it. One of the advantages that Leighton has you know, is, is the economy of uh, scale and, and utilisation, uh, our buying gains across things like fuel, tyres, spare parts, equipment, uh, the cost of our funds. So, 
in many cases, uh, you know, if people want to, to do contract mining, they come to us actually because and it, it is a, a cost-effective solution. Uh, we've seen, you know, since the, uh, the iron ore price uh, dropped uh, and then started recovering, you saw the award of, uh, of Solomon Mine with Fortescue, which was a uh, you know, significant win for us and a re-entry back into the iron ore business. Our gold mines uh, are all doing very well. Uh, as far as thermal coal, uh, yes, we are seeing you know, pressure which you'd expect as the commodity price comes down, but you know, if we look longer term, we believe that the energy demand uh, remains strong and, and will continue to grow both for LNG and thermal coal through the Australasian region and Australia you know, has good uh, deposits. We regularly see our clients reducing fleet size and increasing fleet size. Uh, you're going to see that uh, continue. Uh, it has a, one of the advantages for us is it actually reduces our capex demand uh, going forward so we can allocate our capex uh, and our balance sheet to other areas of the business that uh, we can get returns. So, you know, we, we have a diversified portfolio that uh, inherently within that diversification assists us, uh, you know, to manage these, you know, these cycles as different commodities uh, come up and down. The miners tell me, and you know, I tell everyone, that, that uh, in terms of constructing new mineral ventures, our construction costs are too high. We're not competitive anymore. And I think part of that is your fault. It's part of their fault. Um, we've uh, brought forward a whole series of labour rates and practices, um, similar to desalination, but not the same, if you like, um, that just simply aren't well competitive. Um, the governments are trying to tackle this with guidelines, um, but surely you've got to take some responsibility for that. Look, I think if you look at, you know, are we profiteering by this, you only have to look at our results. Well, I profiteering, I think it's the, it's the agreements you're reaching with the labour force um, that's the problem, not the profiteering. Look, I think the, I don't believe, I said before, I don't believe that the labour is the only issue in productivity. It's, uh, you know, there's all sorts of issues that come into, you know, the environment that we operate in, the logistics, the remoteness of projects, uh, you know, the, the accessibility. Uh, you know, the regulatory environment, you know, compliance, you know, whether it's environmental constraints, uh, acquisition, land acquisition, you know, tax. There's so many things that come into productivity and if you look at Australia, you know, Australia is a significant exporter of commodities and, and it remains so, and, you know, due to our proximity. There is an issue, there's no question with, uh, you know, as, as resources get more and more scarce, of bringing some of these resources uh, to the market and the cost of the infrastructure and the capex, you know, is 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 huge. And how does that get uh, recovered? And some of those projects, at the moment, are, are not feasible as a result of that. But you know, we we've got a, a really good benchmark on productivity that exists not just in Australia but in all the markets that we operate in. We operate across 23 different countries, and and we know, you know, what productivity we get out of people in different regions and where the uh, where the cost base is and you know, we, we will take our services, you know, whether it's in Australia or whether it's into places like Indonesia and India and, you know, Mongolia and, and the Middle East, we, we'll export our core competencies to where projects are, are viable and where the, where the market needs are. To, to the extent that it's labour productivity that is the problem, uh, I accept that it's not the only thing, then you can use your skills in other countries where the labour productivity is not a problem. Look, we, uh, I think what you've seen over time is, you know, modulisation going on, which, uh, you know, is a way of, of obviously, you know, dealing both with a skill shortage as well as, uh, you know, productivity or cost issues. But it's not just driven by, you know, wh where you're focusing on, which is labour productivity. And you know, I think, you know, Leighton's, uh, you know, we're a large employer. We've, you know, we're probably the fifth largest employer in the nation. And, you know, we do a lot of training and support and, and create a lot of jobs for people. And, you know, I, I don't want, you know, for a moment for, you know, people to think that we don't appreciate the effort of, of our skilled, uh, you know, tradesmen and our workers because, you know, at the end of the day, the, the quality of what we, pr we produce in Australia is, is really world class and exceptional. Hamish, last question. Uh, you've talked about the phases within your strategy of stabilising the group, rebasing it and then growing it. Where are you in that timeline? How will a rebase latent differ from the old latent? And where do you see the growth coming from? I think the, you know, first of all, where are we in the timeline and the journey? It, it is a journey. You know, we've status in the presentation that we'll be giving today uh, where we are with a, a lot of the key initiatives. And you can see we've made huge progress after, you know, over the last 12 months. 
Uh, we still have uh, a lot to do over the next 12 months uh, you know, as we're positioning for a, a growth future. Uh, where will the, you know, the growth come from? Uh, you know, we, we continue to see the driver you know, being the urbanisation and you know, the growing prosperity you know, within the Asian region, not just in China. So you know, our growth uh, you know, largely comes from, from pr providing support and the resources uh, to the, you know, the growth we're seeing in our region. And across the countries we operate in, we've probably got a, you know, a GDP of six, six and a half percent. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing a, a doubling of those economies over a 10-year period. And the other thing that we're seeing is, uh, is a huge deficit in infrastructure. You know, globally, there's almost a trillion dollar infrastructure deficit last year, you know, due to fiscal constraints of government. So, you know, those fiscal constraints must be navigated through by government. They must tap into, you know, into private uh, money and, and look at ways of, of recycling their own capital and, and delivering infrastructure. And, you know, so the growth will come in in servicing the infrastructure deficit that's out there and, uh, and, and providing services to the economies in our region that are growing. Hamish, thank you very much indeed thank for you your guys. time. We do appreciate, appreciate it. it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.